Well, joining us now is Chris Trott, a political commentator and a man keeping a weather eye on developments in the Labor Party. Uh, first, Chris, uh, a very good morning to you. Wasn't that remarkably smooth, that, that transition of power? Unprecedented, Sean. <laughs> Never seen anything like it. Um, if I was somebody in the British Conservative Party, I would, I would be almost weeping um, with envy because you think of the, the transition from Boris Johnson to Liz Truss and the damage that was done. Yeah. Uh, then, you know, you realise just what a seamless, what an almost perfect operation that was. Well, so, that yeah. makes me, and, and call stop, me a, uh, a cynic, that makes me think the whole thing was set up over Christmas. Chris. <laughs> well, that would, that would make it even more astonishing because um, to keep a news that uh, explosive quiet for all that time, um, that's almost superhuman. So I, I'm not sure I yeah. share Chris, your Chris, view can I just ask one. you, if you could just back off your phone receiver a little bit, we're just getting a little bit of what's top end crackle um, there. How... Um, how How's that? Oh, just drop your voice a little bit. That's a bit better. Jeez, the um, mobile phones are great, but they don't have the transmission of the good old landline. Um, so, Chris, you, you see, my theory is that they were talking, but this was a put-up job. Now, now with this level of smoothness, that this was a put-up job, and that, you know, late last year, Jacinda Ardern, Grant Robertson and Chris Hipkins got together and, and basically figured out the transition of power. Well, uh, it's it's a theory. I I, I, I can't uh, I can't confirm it. Unfortunately, um, I don't know. Um, but certainly, um, her, her departure took me by surprise. Yeah, and and now we have the new broom, and I think someone used Luke Malpass. If you it may have used that that um, uh, very phrase this morning on the front page of the Dominion Post. We have a new broom, and, and and boy, the changes, the differences are, are marked, aren't they? Well, yes. Someone pointed out yesterday, I think it was, on Twitter, that you've got to go back more than 30 years uh, to find the Labour Party led by um, a man. And I think that's going to make a huge difference because one of Labour's most besetting problems is the gender gap. Uh, and it's only got worse for them over the last, well, two years, shall we say. You mean in that uh, they've got more women voting for them than men? Oh, yeah, Labour has, until very recently anyway, until this change, Labour's been supported disproportionately by women. Mm. and uh, national disproportionately uh, by men. Um, and it's been a long time since Labour was led uh, by a man. And uh, I think if it makes a difference if your party's led by a woman, then it must make also a difference make a if it's <laughs> led by a man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and, and what it, see especially a party that hasn't been led that hasn't had um, uh, male leadership uh, at the very summit um, for such a long time. Yeah. So it is a move, and it's really hard to think of, uh, of politics as one line. It's many, many lines. It's almost a 3D chess game. This is a move towards the middle, though, isn't it, to middle New Zealand from Labor? Oh, look, I, 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 I don't think there's any doubt of that. And I think if you're right, and if this um, was a carefully planned operation, then uh, the primary reason uh, for it is the urgent need for them to make changes, uh, or perhaps that's better expressed as to halt changes, because it was the speed and the the scale of the change that Labor was overseeing, um, particularly in relation to co-governance, uh, that was really alarming. Yeah. And boy, the responses in the press conference yesterday to that, pauses and then very carefully chosen words that did not say co-governance is great. 
ex co governance, we're told, is misunderstood. A and that very middle New Zealand thing, oh, the treaty, well, of course we should give back the stuff we nicked, of course we should address the problems of the past, but I didn't hear a commitment to a transformed New Zealand with two separate systems of governance. I didn't hear him no. saying that Māori never ceded sovereignty to the Crown. He was also very careful to say the treaty is between the Crown, not New Zealand or the people of New Zealand, and Māori leadership. Yes. It's a shame in a way that uh, he, he didn't have a week or so in the job as the sworn-in Prime Minister of New Zealand before he had to go to Ratana. Yeah. Because... Um, well, well the Prime Minister's going there. I mean, Jacinda Ardern's going there with him too. He's he's holding a yeah. handbag, as it were. But uh, that would have been, had things perhaps happened a little sooner, that would have been the ideal moment, I think, to um, redraw Labour's um, position on this whole matter. Because I think, I think the best line... Uh, for Chris Hipkins to take is not necessarily to just um, roll back uh, the entire process, but to state the plain truth of the matter, which is that the argument has not been made. It has not been made publicly and openly and honestly to the extent that the people of New Zealand understand what is asked of them, and agree with it. And I think if he was to say, look, we haven't made the case, clearly we haven't made the case, because you only have to look at people's unease about um, three waters to, to grasp just how badly we have failed to make the case, mm. and that you cannot progress with a, you know, quote, transformation or unquote, constitutional upheaval in a country without taking the people with you. You just can't. I mean, it's a recipe for civil war yeah. to do anything other than that. All right. So he has, well, he slowed the ship on that, and we don't know if he's going to turn it around, but he probably wants to stop it and stop us progressing further towards that. There has inevitably, Chris, got to be a bite back from Maori activists, and I'm not going to say Maori in general because I don't think the Maori activists and the extremes of Maori politics represent uh, average Maori at all uh, at, at present. But there's got to be a blowback from from the Willie Jacksons, from the John Tamahiris, from the Maori Party, from from all these people who have been living in the age of Maori wonderfulness for a few years now. Well. It will infuriate people um, uh, to even contemplate the proposition, or some people, but I've been around the traps long enough, and I, I suspect you have too, Sean, to know that if Chippy was to make a strong stand against Maori nationalists, mm. um, it would do him absolutely no harm at all. Wow, but then... Uh, yeah, but what's the reaction to that going to be? Um, I mean, not, not in, fr from the extremes, not not from the yeah, general yeah, public. I, yeah, agree, yeah, I agree. Oh, yeah. I think this is the strategy, and I think he will. And I think he. that's why he was so careful yesterday. He knows it's coming, but that wasn't part of the carefully worked out plan to do it yesterday. So he's very cautious around those questions. Um, but he was laying the groundwork for making the sort of statement you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, and look... If you will indulge me, I will very briefly relay um, a famous story from World War II All right. about Māori and Pākehā. The story that is told is of a troop ship um, docking, uh, I don't know whether it was at Durban or somewhere, they were probably on that coast and heading up towards um, Egypt. And the word came out that uh, the troops on board could go ashore um, that is the white troops, not the black troops. And the New Zealanders heard this and they just sent back the reply, if Pākehā aren't going, uh, if Māori aren't going, then Pākehā aren't going either. We'll, we prefer to stay on the ship. Now, 
that's the spirit, I think, that has built the country that we love. And that is the spirit that has to be recaptured. Um, that spirit of goodwill, that spirit that we are all New Zealanders and we will be treated all the same or you can go yourself. Well, that's a um, dramatic departure from much of what is going on well, inside the Beltway at the moment, Chris. Exactly, exactly. And this, I think you put your finger on a really important issue because it's one thing to have a new Prime Minister. It's quite another thing for a change of attitude to filter all the way down to the sort of people who wrote the rules um, ar ar around the, uh, the public journalism um, fund. Yeah. Uh, fund, right? And this, this is going to be a problem, I think, uh, for any politician who tries to roll this back because the depth to which these ideas are entrenched in the public service in academia uh, is really unprecedented uh, and it's going to require some fairly stern words from the ministerial level um, to uh, get the message through um, that th these these notions that uh, a particularly radical reading of the Treaty of Waitangi is actually um, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That sort of attitude is going to have to be tackled head on um, because uh, it's, it is deeply entrenched across a lot um, of really important areas of New Zealand society. Well, there's I mean, no indication the to, National up, Party up, was going to do that, to Chris. And including the judiciary, which yeah, yeah, is really yeah. the most alarming um, aspect of all. Yeah. Um, Chris, there's no indication the nas a new National Government would do that, would be that radical. In fact, Chris Luxon is pussyfooted around these issues. Yep, yep, and I think that, uh, in in a way, is a measure of the strengths of, of Labor's um, jiu-jitsu tactics that it will be incredibly problematic <laughs> for, for both national and act um, if, if, uh, if Chris Hipkins deftly removes the face cards um, from their hands. Man, you are talking, though, about a big, big political shift in, in strategy. And now listening to what you're saying, I, I can say if, if Chris Hipkins wants to win, that's what he has to do, not just take the edges off. Um, the Treaty of Waitangi issue, but to actually deal with it, it's a hell of a bold move. Well, um, for a party that was staring um, at the locomotive <laughs> coming straight for them, them. Um, yeah, um, um, bold moves would appear to be the order of the day. Um, without bold moves, um, I don't think that... that Locomotive is going to be slowed uh, appreciably. Yeah. Well, what I can also see happening, Chris, and let's just spitball this, um, and my mind's sort of spinning now at the way you've put it, and I, I appreciate what you've done. Let's say, okay, that, that, that they do decide that's the strategy. We're going to actually, on issues of race, uh, we are going to outflank national on the right, as it were, right? We are actually going to have the debate that the country and David Seymour has been screaming we need to have about yep. one person, one vote, the nature of a modern democracy. Yep. That, I think, would result in a revolt in that Māori Party caucus and maybe the end of the majority. That might trigger an early election. Got it and won. <laughs> I mean... Work it, work it through from the from the original premise, um, Sean. That uh, that this was cooked up between the three of them um, several weeks ago, mm. um, if not months ago. Um, if you're going to war game this, yeah. that's the point you arrive at automatically um, because you can't deal with the problem of being unelectable on these issues without facing down your Māori caucus. If the Māori caucus oh. feels that aggrieved, it will pull the pin. If you well, pull it will. The pin, it will feel that it, aggrieved. Yeah. The it, loss of it mana in the, itself already, yep, yep, I'd say, is if, egregious. Yeah, if you could hear it in the in the voices of the Māori journalists yesterday. Actually, yeah, yeah. Just the, sh the sheer 
anger and I said... Well, I was there. I was, I, there. I, I, I was sitting two seats away from him. Yep. And, yep, I, and, I, and the growing realisation during the press yep. conference yep. that she was watching a government, a Labour administration, walking back. Yeah. Walking yep. back its it, position on things, you, treaty and you, co-governance. That's right. You could hear, you could hear the realisation that they had lost their protector, they had lost yeah. their facilitator, their enabler, and and this person behind the podium was a very different kettle of fish. Yeah. But if they do pull the pin, then a snap election is entirely justified, mm. and it will be called by Chris Hipkins, and he will run the argument that this issue um, is too important to wait, uh, you know, any more months. If 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 they want to have this argument now, rather than within the party, if they want to extend it to the whole country, then that's what we'll do, and we'll settle this. And boy, bold <laughs> move, bold move. I think, yeah, I think National Act would just be sitting there in gas going, but 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 but. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, but, okay. But, Look, yeah, really that's interesting that's theorizing. A, really yeah, interesting. Look, right. The other thing, Chris, I want to say, the only time it came up was when um, activist journalist Mark Dulder from Newsroom timidly, but from behind his ass, mask, sorry, mask, asked a question at the end of the of the press conference yesterday. Oh, what do you think about climate change? And we just got, well, I don't know, we got 30 seconds of platitudes. Oh, yes, it's the most important thing. Place, you know, facing the planet, blah, 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 and then moved on. That, too, seems to be an issue not at the forefront of Chris Hipkins' mind. Well, Chris Hipkins um, strikes me as someone, well, he always has, actually. I mean, he's a fairly ruthless fellow. Mm. I mean, he, he's one of these politicians. Um, reminds me a bit of, uh, of, of Jim Anderton, in a way, um, mm. He 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 could um, he could he, he could sing Danny Boy with tears rolling down his eyes and then while turn around while, and be while, a complete while, yeah, while, 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 while his henchmen were kneecapping people in the back room. Um, yeah. uh, and and I I, I think Tippy's got um, a, a measure of that. He can he can be the boy from the hut and he's bright and cheery and he's got a winning smile. Yeah. But uh, it, it doesn't pay to cross him, yeah. um, and I think as that strength is given a chance to reveal itself, um, New Zealanders will respond quite positively because New Zealanders really do like strong leaders. I mean, uh, mm. as well as that. that. Look, that's been a fascinating chat, Chris. Look, just one other thing, and of course, all the pill clutching. Um, Feminist writers and stuff, and Alison Moore said, "Oh, she was hounded from office by bad, bad men and misogynists." Do you buy any of that? Oh, I think there was an element. Uh, I mean, but the, you know, the the febrile at atmosphere politically in New Zealand over the last um, year or so, uh, you know, is is palpable, and and the prime minister or former prime minister. Copped um, more than her fair share of that, but so did a great many other people. I mean, mm. all around the world, uh, polarisation, political polarisation, uh, is a problem. All around the world, uh, the fanaticism generated by social media uh, is a problem. Yes, um, Jacinda was on the receiving end of a great deal of that, but that I do not believe was what drove her from office. What drove her from office, if she was indeed driven, mm. um, and and simply didn't realise that I'm not the person who can do this now, um, was that they had got way ahead of themselves in policy terms. Um, the country was becoming increasingly alarmed at the direction the government was taking. Um, she didn't feel that she could manage the U-turn. Um, but the important thing to remember in all this is that those three amigos came in together in 2008 and they've been pretty much um, shaping Labour's mm. destiny ever since. And and now it's the third of the amigos <laughs> um, who, who is stepping up and, mm. and he may prove to be the toughest hombre of them all. 
Chris, really good talking to you. Thank you so much for your time uh, this morning. That is Chris Trotter, old lefty, political commentator, and boy, what a scenario he paints. Labour outflanks national on the right on issues of the Treaty of Waitangi. It is, well, anything's possible in politics.